Each weekday morning, it's the most important meal. But on the weekends, it goes a little wild. I'm Mo Rocca, and this is Breakfast and Brunch on Foodography. Wake up, foodographists. In this hour, it's your morning smorgasbord, complete with old school pancakes, new school pancakes, eggs and bacon, eggs and stew, eggs and greens, eggs and pizza. Plus, dim sum, chilas, and bellinis for everyone. Some mornings I love getting out the old blender and making healthy smoothies for the whole family. You just put some fruit in there and then some yogurt and... Oh, I don't actually drink the smoothies. I'm more of a Bloody Mary guy. Breakfast is that kick in the pants that gets you moving in the morning. It can be a cup of coffee, a giant omelet, or pancakes on a stick. There are no rules. Breakfast is whatever it takes to get you out the door. The word breakfast means exactly that, to break the fast, the fast of your overnight sleep. Any mom will tell you, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But what did we eat before the toaster came along? Well, 12,000 years ago, cavemen ate whatever they could find. Fruits, nuts, yams, and if they were quick enough, something a little um, meatier. During the Middle Ages in Europe, many people didn't eat breakfast. They had to wait until noon to eat a large meal that they called dinner. The only people likely to eat a morning meal were farmers and laborers, and that meal was no great shakes. In a lot of cultures, it's really traditional to have really porridgey kinds of breakfast, right? Gruel and oatmeal and rice congee, and they're not really sexy foods. But if you think about them, they're really filling. This is how you're gonna wanna start the day. Luckily, there was toast. As basic a breakfast as can be in Great Britain during the Middle Ages, toast called sops was often sopped or dunked into liquids like wine. Toward the end of the 16th century, people began pairing toast with tasty things like poached eggs, scrambled eggs, ham, bacon, melted cheese, and butter. You know, breakfast. Americans have so many tasty options for breakfast and brunch because our society is so diverse. We can thank immigrants for everything from bagels and lox to coffee cake to waffles. But nowadays, our breakfast options go well beyond the traditional, and we're coming up with new breakfast foods every day, even when it comes to eggs. Humans have been eating eggs since, well, forever. Jungle fowl were domesticated in India by 3200 BCE, and records from China and Egypt show that domesticated fowl were laying eggs for human consumption around 1400 BCE. When people think of cooking eggs, they think, oh yeah, easy, I can do that. But in fact, cooking an egg perfectly is probably one of the hardest things to do. In fact, in order for chefs who go through culinary school to get their degrees, they have to be able to cook several egg dishes to perfection, including something as simple as scrambled eggs. This is the 100 uh, full chef hat, which represents the 100 ways that the chef should be knowing how to cook an eggs. There's this legend that every fold on a chef's toque is supposed to denote how many ways that chef can cook an egg. So that really tells you how important eggs are and how much variety there is. Nobody knows for sure who came up with the idea that the number of pleats you have indicates how many different ways you can cook an egg. But I'm betting it was the guy who got to 100 first. It's one of the classic things that a chef should be knowing is how to cook an egg. There's simplicity, but there's also a lot of techniques. Eggs don't have the most exciting reputation. But at Bar Breton in Manhattan, Chef Cyril Renault really knows how to make them come out of their shells. It's actually uh, amazing because every one of us has a different ways of how they like their eggs. And uh, it's actually pretty challenging for a restaurant. But this chef cooks eggs in ways that are so cool, you'll want to order them his way every time. Like the eggs on cocotte with beef stew. So here I'm placing the plastic wrap into a ring mold. I'm gonna place also a little bit of uh, olive oil. 
replacing it with a salt and pepper. From there on, we will tie it and we will place it into simmering water. And it's going to poach for five minutes. We're going to remove them out of the water. Then from there, we will plate with the potato purees. Then uh, we're going to place the eggs in the middle. We we'll remove the plastic. And then from there, we will put the beef bourguignon stew around it. And I'm going to finish the dish with some of the baby green here. Here you have the of cocotte with the beef bourguignon and the mashed potato puree. But it's a safe bet that Chef Cyril isn't done adding folds to his toque. His mastery goes beyond the traditional soft-boiled egg. We fried soft-boiled eggs. Basically, it's instead of having uh, soft boils, we're actually recreating the eggs by doing a shell around it with the breadcrumbs. We're creating the eggs in uh, boiling water here. Remove the eggs from the water, shell the eggs. We place it first in the flour. Then we place it in the egg wash, and then to the breadcrumbs. That will create the shell. Put it in the fryer and fry it for about two to three minutes, which we're giving a brown shell. Then we take it out and we slice it in half. Then uh, the eggs is placed on the Caesar salad. Having a beautiful and uh, leisurely breakfast is actually a beautiful thing. It's uh, one of the pleasures of life. And the better the breakfast, the better the day will be. Simply stunning. I wonder what his Denver omelet looks like. Coming up, pizza for breakfast that isn't leftovers. Plus, it's grab-and-go good morning goodies with a spicy chorizo sandwich on wheels. Which one is breakfast? Which one is brunch? Do you really have to ask? When it comes to iconic breakfast foods, it's hard to top cereal, one of your grocery store's top 10 best sellers. There are countless varieties, from crazy sugar sweet to high fiber healthy whole grain. In fact, cold breakfast cereal started out as a health food. As America prospered in the 1800s, Americans were eating more meat but less fiber. Some doctors thought the path to better nutrition was through whole grain cereals. The first pre-cooked breakfast cereal was invented in 1863 and was called granula. It was made of the same whole wheat flour used to make graham crackers and pie crusts, and it had a lot of bran and fiber. It was so hard, it had to soak in milk overnight just to be edible. For some reason, it was not a hit. Since cold cereal could only get better, it eventually did. In 1895, breakfast pioneers Will Keith and John Harvey Kellogg ran the Battle Creek Spa and Sanitarium. They wanted to create a healthy cereal for their patients that was easy to eat. They found a way to cook wheat flour and roll it out to make soft flakes. Lo and behold, the flakes went great with cold milk. The cereal was so popular that ex-patients would order it by mail. Later, they experimented with other grains and introduced corn flakes in 1898. But maybe you're not a cereal person. Maybe a nice slice of cold pizza is your thing. Nothing wrong with that, but you can do better. Bacon, pizza, eggs, cheese, it's gonna be beautiful. At Motorino, the pizza is hot, perfect for brunch, and sunny side up. Any kind of pizza will be better, richer, with an egg on top. People don't expect to take their brunch in a pizzeria, but uh, the pizza al uovo really gives the people who are familiar with the eggs and their bacon and they want it, give them a reason to come and eat pizza. This is how I make my pizza al uovo. Ingredients are mozzarella di bufala, smoked bacon, pecorino, and then the eggs. Gonna slice 
buffalo mozzarella into small cubes and I'm just going to spread them onto the pie. Now I'm gonna put the smoked bacon onto the pie. Then the pecorino. Now a little bit of olive oil. And the pizza is ready to go into the oven. Now I'm ready to add the eggs. Back in the oven it goes. And by the time it takes for the egg white to be fully cooked, the pizza will be ready. I'm going to finish it with basil. A little bit of chili oil. And this is the pizza al uovo. Having this topping on the pizza was really organic for us. And it fits very well what you want to eat for brunch. Well, now I've got a reason, or rather, an excuse. On the run, but still need something hot to start your day? Nowadays, there are a buffet of options for breakfast on the go. There's drive through breakfast. And in most major cities, there are breakfast carts ready to serve you. Arturo Macedo and Maribel Tellez are a brother-sister team on a mission to provide a quick, quality breakfast to anyone and everyone within walking distance. Can I have the Mexican wrap? That's okay. Yeah. People don't like to wait. That's why we have to be very fast. You know, the faster we can, the people is happy and they go to work and time. Food carts have been serving up meals on New York City streets since the 1800s. And coffee carts are an important part of the breakfast rush. I think that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Every single day you wake up, you have to start with good breakfast. Our food is uh, simple, our ingredients are, are natural. And fresh. All the customers who work around here, they like to come have a breakfast every single day. We call it uh, a diner of wheels. And befitting their heritage, Arturo and Maribel's menu has a distinct Mexican flair. The chorizo egg and cheese sandwich, we started to throw in the chorizo on the grill. I have to chop it fine. So the, the flavor spreads all over the egg, like an omelet style. At the end, we throw some cheese on it. We have one seven grain that nobody else has. It's, uh, it gives the flavor, the, the, the final touch. A lot of our customers like our hot sauce because it's nicely spiced. It's a good balance to our sandwich. That's one of the simple reasons our customers are coming back. Without breakfast, it's like you're not like happy, you know? And just like that, you've got breakfast. Coming up, have your boarding passes ready. We're doing breakfast abroad with a savory sea bass tart from China and Indian chilas with chutney. We are outsourcing the delicious. No matter what time it is, someone somewhere is having breakfast in exotic locales like Tahiti or Delaware. It's the first meal of the day. But what exactly are they eating? Breakfast is something that we all have to have, no matter where we are around the world, because you need something in your stomach to start your day. Whether you're having bacon and eggs in America, or you're having fish and rice in Asia, or idlis in India, we all need something in our bellies before we get going. In France, one might have a flaky, buttery croissant. In Scotland, oatmeal with thick cream. In Mexico, one might wake up with a delicious tripe soup called menudo, especially if one has been drinking the night before. But Spain tops them all with churros y chocolate, sort of their version of the donut. Deep fried, rolled in sugar, and dunked in cups of dark, thick, hot chocolate. Good morning, waistband. And in Hong Kong, there's a strong tradition of having breakfast for lunch, and that's because they're eating dim sum. Dim sum is totally like the Chinese spiritual cousin to brunch. It's always social. You get together with friends, you have tea, and you're eating these little morsels, which are, you know, little dumplings or little buns, and sometimes a little bit of rice or noodles to sort of finish it all off. 
Part of what makes the meal so fun is the variety. Shared small plates allow you to sample a little bit of everything. The term you use in Cantonese to talk about going out for dim sum is yam cha, which literally means to drink tea. So where it started really was in tea houses, where people wanted to encourage you to drink tea and you know, sample the chef's skill. But then it caught on, and eventually they started becoming more and more popular in bigger and bigger restaurants. And eventually, you have these huge dim sum palaces that can literally seat a thousand people at a time. For a closer look at dim sum, we visit Chinatown Brasserie, where chef Joe Ng is known for making more than just the average dumpling. Chinese can eat anything in any meal. If they taste good, they want to get early in the morning. So that's why in China, most of the people have a dim sum for breakfast every day. And while Chef Ng may eat dim sum every day, this black bass avocado tart is not your everyday dim sum. Some wasabi mayo, fried ginger to garnish. Here we go, black bass avocado tart. Still hungry? No worries. Chef Ng has a not two, not three, but a four mushroom dumpling for you. We make the dough with potato starch and wheat starch, roll into the very thin, and then we try to get the shape of the dough like a circle. And then we try to put all the filling in the center, and we twist it with three different holes. Dim sum is something for everybody. From dumplings to jumbo shrimp that look like swans, it's beautiful and it's breakfast. A quick spin of the globe whisks us off to India. Well, an Indian restaurant anyway, for a classic Indian breakfast with chef Suvir Saran. My grandmother always said, you are what you eat and if you begin with a great breakfast, you remain a good person all day long. The crepes we are making today, the chilas, are the epitome of great breakfast food from northern India. Just like Indians love it. Hot, spicy, sour, sweet, all at once. Healthy flour that we add some carom seeds into. And carom seeds are a digestive and some cayenne for a little heat. And to that, we just add a little water. And you have the beginnings of a wonderful crepe. Crepes are popular all over the world, and the typical French one is made from a light batter of wheat or buckwheat flour and stuffed with savory or sweet fillings. But in Indian cuisine, the crepe variations get kicked up a notch because even the batters are made from a host of different flours, like chickpea, lentil, or rice. You take just a little bit of the batter, put it into the pan, and then spread it and I take a little bit of oil and pour it on top of the chickpea flour. Looks a bit like pancakes, just the savory, healthy chickpea flour kind. You can smell this nutty aroma coming out of the pan. That's the chickpea flour cooking, and you flip it, look, this is perfection. At this point, we just fold it, and you put it on a plate. I think as Americans, we need to get out of the rut of eating bad breakfast. Fast food doesn't have to be dumpy and horrible for you. Of course, there are Indian breakfast drinks, too. Tea is for the everyday indulgence, but luxury comes by drinking lassi or a lassi with flavor. That's like you've been spoiled. You know, lassis are the original yogurt smoothies, if you will, and we've had them for millennia. We added whatever flavors and fruits and seasonings that were available locally. And it's not just South Asia that's crazy about their yogurt drinks. You can find them all over the Middle East. In fact, the word for yogurt comes from the Turkish yoğurt. It's sour, it's sweet, it's saffrony. Mm. I wish I drank less soda and more lassi. I'd be slimmer and better looking. Don't go away. This is a six-course brunch. Three more to go. And I've got a few more tricks up my sleeve on foodography.
pardon my dinerese, but I'd like a stack of Vermont with some cow paste and motor oil, plus Adam and Eve on a raft and wreck them. Oh, and give it shoes, I'm in a rush. In case you're confused, that's how you'd order pancakes with maple syrup and butter and scrambled eggs on toast to go. But what I'd really like is a donut, the ultimate grab and go food. The modern donut evolved from proto donuts of centuries past, like the sweetbreads ancient Romans would fry in oil. Dutch settlers get the credit for bringing the donut to America, but they did nothing to advance donut technology. Their oily coken or oily cakes were balls of dough fried in oil. Alas, no holes, thus soggy, uncooked centers. Truth be told, Dutch settlers were terrible donut makers. So who invented the donut hole? Many fried cake experts say it was American ship captain Hansen Gregory, who poked out the soggy center of his wife's donut in 1847 to stick it on the spoke of his steering wheel. Now that story may be full of holes and bad puns, but it wasn't long after that that donuts became an American favorite. If you're a fan of donuts, but also insist on a savory side to your breakfast, Chicago's Nightwood Restaurant has just the thing for you. One decadent dish that includes all the best elements of breakfast. Every week we serve the bacon butter scotch donut. Nightwood's chef de cuisine, Jason Vincent, is the evil genius behind these porky pastries. It's a yeast raised donut cooked in the fryer. We roll it in butterscotch, a really, really, really amazing butterscotch, buttery butterscotch. And then we make bacon, we cure it for about a week, we braise it in maple syrup, and that becomes the bacon component. I mean, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, man, but I'll say it again, these things will make you fat. <laughs> They're kind of insanely good. All right, all right, we've been warned. Now let's make donuts. We're gonna pour warm milk into the vessel. We're gonna sprinkle the yeast, and then yeast feeds off of sugar. You're gonna put in some egg yolks, and at that point, you can add all your dry ingredients, flour, sugar, a little bit of salt. At that point, you wanna add in melted butter and really beat the hell out of it for, for a minute or two. Let it relax. Once you've turned it out onto the table on your floured surface, yeah, at that point, you just roll it out, you flour it up a little bit. Punch them out, this donut cutter is really, really, really a lifesaver. Inevitably, all good things must come to the deep fryer. Once they're fried and they've cooled just slightly, dip them into room temperature butterscotch. The butterscotch will melt under the residual heat of the donut. No sense in just doing one side. It's really kind of a beautiful, giving, seductive sight, just seeing this donut melt into what it feels that it needs to be coated in. Then you flip it over and really aggravate it. And that's what you end up with, this really kind of loving fried bread. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. Fried cake, I mean, for crying out loud, it's awesome. That reminds me, I should invest in some stretchy bands. You can't just have donuts without coffee. Our love affair with coffee is hundreds of years old. Coffee got a boost on our shores after the Boston Tea Party in 1773, when Americans tossed tea overboard and proceeded to snub the lighter brew henceforth. But coffee was first discovered in what is now Ethiopia. Legend has it in the 9th century, a goat herder named Kaldi noticed the kick his goats got out of eating bright red coffee cherries, which encased the caffeine-rich beans. From Ethiopia, coffee spread across the Arab world. The word coffee is derived from the Arabic kawat al bun which means wine of the bean. Venetian merchants introduced coffee to Europe in 1650, and soon lemonade vendors were peddling it on the streets of Italy. Coffee came back indoors when automatic espresso machines were invented in the 1900s. Today in Italy, espresso is the national breakfast. Sounds fancy, but it's basically just strong coffee. Espresso comes from the Italian verb to press, 
because water under high pressure is forced through coffee grounds, allowing it to be brewed very quickly. That's good news for those in need of a fix. More importantly, it's the basis for popular coffee drinks, like cappuccinos, lattes, and mochas. For a look at the latest in espresso, we go to Chicago to visit the experts at Lavazza Cafe. So today, for you, I'm going to make espresso. Espresso is the coffee that you can eat. All right, I'm impressed. But how exactly does he get coffee to hang upside down? Well, Espresso is one of the innovative products from Lavazza, and it's from a collaboration with world-renowned chef Ferran Adria. Many of the foams and futuristic foods you've seen on Foodography have been inspired by Ferran Adria's blend of science and cooking, which has inspired chefs all around the world. Well, the first thing I'm doing is mixing the dry ingredients. One of the main components is, of course, uh, sugar. And we're just going to mix those in with a freshly pulled espresso. Once we've determined that the ingredients are fully combined, we're going to want to reduce the amount of bubbles that go into our siphon. And to do that, we're just going to strain it. So now that we've got the ingredients in the siphon, what we're going to want to do is charge it. By charging, I mean we're going to incorporate the N2O into the siphon. N2O is nitrous oxide, or what your dentist calls laughing gas. The laughing gas mixes with the espresso in the canister. And when it comes out, it expands, turning the liquid into foam. The espresso is a, a, a play on words, really. You're taking espresso and taking the Italian word spesso, meaning thick, and you get espesso. There you have it. More ways to order your coffee and confound your barista. Coming up, a whole bunch of brunch, starting with, what else? A cocktail. And what goes better with a Bellini than a smorgasbord of smoky, savory Swedish delights? You'll want a seat at this table. If you think foodography tastes good on TV, take a ride down the information superhighway to cookingchannelTV.com. I love breakfast, but when the weekend comes, it's time for brunch. The difference between breakfast and brunch is, really, it's just a matter of attitude. It's how you approach it. Right? For most people, breakfast is, eat, got to go to work, uh, you're, you're not even awake. For brunch, though, you're leisurely, you're taking your time, you're going to be drinking before noon, and all of a sudden, you're like, ah. Oh. And if we have anyone to thank for brunch, it's the English. The word brunch was a late 19th century creation. It was coined in England, and it basically took two words, breakfast and lunch, and put them together. And it started out as a hunter's meal. It was something that after you'd go hunting early in the morning with the dogs and the whole thing, you'd come back and there'd be this glorious, huge meal laid out for you. I mean, these people knew how to live. Brunch came to our shores in the 1930s, when fashionable hotels started serving it on weekends. Now it's a fixture on many of the restaurant weekend menus. Sunday brunch's popularity grew after World War II, when American church going declined. Formal Sunday lunches gave way to lazy, laid-back brunches. And of course, you can't have brunch without a cocktail. There's.